So far, we haven't made reference to a specific coordinate system uh, against which to measure the motions of our two masses, except to say that the coordinate system was a, an inertial coordinate system. In this section, we'll discuss uh, the center of mass coordinate system and how to cast the problem in terms of relative coordinates, coordinates relative to that center of mass. And as we'll see, there's an interesting uh, parameter, the reduced mass, that just pops right out of that analysis. Using this approach will allow us to cast the Lagrangian for the central force motion in terms of just two vectors, the position of the center of mass and the vector describing the relative positions of the two masses. We won't need to keep track of the positions of, of each individual mass. And as we'll find, since the center of mass coordinate system is inertial, we'll actually be able to ignore the center of masses motion, and so we'll actually reduce the whole problem down to consideration of a single vector, the relative displacement between the two masses. Okay, so coming back to our system, here's our mass 1 and our mass 2. Uh, remember that we have a, a vector little r which points from mass 2 to mass 1. Now we, uh, we identify the center of mass for the whole system, the center of mass being right here. We're going to refer to that position using capital R. And all of these positions now, keep in mind, are referred to an inertial frame, which I've sort of sketched down here. So we've, we're being, the inertial frame is arbitrary. It's, it's located somewhere in space, but what's important about it is that it's inertial, meaning that Newton's laws apply in a simple way. The position of the center of mass, as you may recall from chapter 3, capital R, is given by uh, the mass 1 times its position vector plus mass 2 times its position vector divided through by the total mass of the system. Um, you can sort of rewrite that by... Uh, defining F1 and F2. These are the fraction of the system's mass that's in M1 and MM and in M2. So F1 or F2 is just mass 1 or 2 divided by the total mass of the system. And so uh, what this represents, remember, capital R, is the mass-weighted average position for the two particles in the system. So it's the average position for the two particles in the system weighted by their individual masses. Now, if we define uh, capital M just to be the total mass for the system, you may recall that we can write the system's total momentum vector is just the sum of the momentum vector for each individual mass. And then we can, it turns out, if, if you recall from chapter 3, we can write that total momentum vector as the total mass of the system times the velocity vector for the center of mass. And so we don't need to keep track of, in order to keep uh, track of the total system's momentum, we don't actually need to keep track of the individual momenta for each of the particles, we just need to keep track of the uh, center of masses velocity. That'll give us the total system momentum vector. Okay, so remember that we want to go from uh, keeping track of the individual positions of the two particles uh, to using this uh, relative coordinate system, capital R being the center of mass coordinate, little r being the difference uh, in displace, the difference in positions but for the two uh, masses. So remember, little r is the difference in the two displacement vectors. Big R is given by this expression, the center of mass. And so that means we can rewrite the vector R2 as R1 minus little r. And then we can plug that expression into here. And what we'll find is big R is going to be M1 over capital M times R1 vector plus M2 over capital M times R1. And then there's this minus R over here. So we'll uh, c combine these two terms here. And we get an expression that looks like this. So M1 plus M2 over big M times R1. Well, this, of course, is just 1. And then the second term, uh, minus M2 over big M times the little uh, R vector. And that's all got to be equal to the center of mass coordinate. And therefore, we can rewrite the R1 vector. We can keep track of the this first mass's position by keeping track of the center of mass and then multiplying little r by M2 over big M. We'll find that there's a similar expression for R2. I'm not going to show it here, but it looks like this. Okay, so coming back to our kinetic energy, remember that it's this right here. Uh, we can make these replacements for R1 dot and R2 dot that we just derived. So R1 dot is going to be the time derivative of R1, of course, that we just wrote in terms of capital R and little r. That's given by that expression there. Same thing is true for R2 dot. It's given by this expression here. Uh, this squared for each of these, remember, 
means dot this vector into itself. And so when we do that, uh, we find that we get uh, one term here, big R dot squared. Then we get another term here uh, involving little r dot squared. So that's those two vectors dotted into themselves. And then there's this cross term, uh, which involves the dot product between big R dots and little r dots with a plus sign up front. You get something similar for, uh, for the second uh, term in the kinetic energy. So here's the uh, big R dot squared times mass 2. Then the term involving little r dot squared. But now look at the difference in uh, expressions having to do with the masses here. And then finally the cross term here uh, is exactly the same uh, as the cross term in the first uh, term of the kinetic energy, but now we have a minus sign. And so these two terms will cancel out. So we lose the cross term altogether. Now we need to deal with uh, the combination of this and this. You can see both of those terms are being multiplied by little r dot squared. And so we're going to add up those two uh, strange combinations of the masses. That's going to look like this. So it's an m1 times m2 squared over big M plus m2, m1 squared over big M. We can take an m1 out of here and an m2 out of here, and what we'll get is m1 times m2 over big M. And then what's left is a sum m1 plus m2 over big M. This, of course, is just 1. And so, the t in the end, the total kinetic energy we get is a kinetic energy term involving motion of the center of mass for the system, and then a term involving uh, the radial displacement between the two masses, r, uh, little r dot squared. In fact, remember this is a scalar, so we'll get rid of this little vector symbol here. Um, in any case, uh, what you have here then uh, is a term involving the center of mass motion and the relative motion of two things. And then there's another term here that involves sort of a funny combination of the masses. This is called the reduced mass. Um, and we'll see it plays in a prominent role in the dynamics of the system shortly. And so to sum up, our kinetic energy looks like this. This, is, this, is a, this term has to do with motion of the center of mass. This term has to do with relative motion of the two masses uh, with respect to one another. Then, of course, we have a potential energy, which we're not specifying, except to say that it's a cent it corresponds to a central force. So it only depends upon the radial displacement between the two masses, not on their actual positions. So when we write the Lagrangian, we get uh, three terms. One term, again, having to do with set motion of the center of mass. And then a second term here, which is really motion within the system. Um, and so we can think about this Lagrangian as consisting of two terms. One term having to do with motion of the center of mass. The other one having to do with relative motion between the two masses. And as we'll find in, in the next chapter, this term actually doesn't contribute uh, to the dynamics within the system. Since there's no other forces that we need to consider in the problem, the only term that actually will contribute anything interesting to the dynamics will be this term right here.